Hello guys, welcome back to Rewind Reviews and welcome to another spoiler talk. I haven't done one of these videos in a little while and I thought that with the release of Guardians of the Galaxy Volume 3 there was definitely a lot of things that I did want to talk about, I did want to address but it did go into spoiler territory so I thought why don't I just save all that for a spoiler talk video so let's get into it. So the first minor thing that I wanted to mention that I did briefly touch on in my spoiler free review was one aspect of the costume designs when it came to Star-Lord. I was convinced that he was going to get his helmet in this one, the comic accurate one and I was convinced that they were sort of hiding it in a lot of the marketing but for some reason they don't actually give him his helmet whatsoever in this movie because I thought with this being potentially the final Guardians movie potential final appearance of Star Wars this is their opportunity to give him that comic accurate look especially since they all have their very comic accurate Guardians costumes so we did find it weird that they didn't actually do that especially since like I think how much time has sort of passed between the two Guardians movies around about 10 years or something like that and nobody within all that time even Rocket making all these adjustments to Nebula the way she's now got like an arm cannon and all this new gear and all sorts that she uses that nobody went hey why don't we make some new breathing gear or some sort of thing to help us breathe in space so I was definitely a bit split on that decision especially when it comes to that sequence towards the end where he's jumping from uh, the high evolutionary ship onto nowhere and he doesn't have his mask on or anything and then he gets stuck in space and then he just starts freezing and icing up and I thought why doesn't he have his helmet? I do actually quite like the idea of him going back and retrieving the zoom and that basically being the thing that ultimately leads his downfall because that's a really nice way of kind of tying back into what happened in volume one where he goes back to go and get his walkman from the kiln but him not having his helmet was the thing that was going through my head throughout that entire sequence why doesn't he have it? I thought that when he was jumping across uh, through space I thought he was going to click a button and the helmet was going to appear and that would be the, the scene where we actually do see him wearing it but he doesn't so I was sort of wondering like well, why is, is that the direction that they're going with this because I feel like that would have been a really stupid way for them to have, to have killed him off I was fully expecting Gamora to be the one to save him and that sort of being a parallel to what happened with her and him in the first movie where he saved her from outside uh, nowhere so I'm glad that they didn't kill him off within that moment I'm glad that Adam Warlock is the one who does get a chance to save and redeem himself even though it is very rushed how his character is handled I do think that there was a really good emotional story that was there that he just didn't really explore with all the stuff going on with his mum the relationship that he has with uh, the High Evolutionary with the way that High Evolutionary is the one who created him I feel like there is a really good idea for them to have had a lot of tension between them I think that could have been built up enough Aisha who's played by Elizabeth Debicki who is essentially his mother she's the one who's sort of looking after him throughout this movie she is killed off and I feel like that is enough reason for him to want to join the Guardians and go for revenge after the High Evolutionary but they don't do that so I feel like that is definitely a missed opportunity and it would have been a really good way of sort of adding to his character and giving him a bit more of a reason for being in this movie outside of the initial thing the only reason that Adam is in this movie in the first place is to be the one who damages Rocket to the point where he needs to be saved but then after that that's really all he contributes to the story I do get the impression that whatever Adam's story was originally meant to be how it was ingrained into this story I do feel like it was pushed to the side or because they wanted to focus on Rocky's origin story they had to find some way of tying Adam into the story because it was all set up in volume 2 and they needed to have him in this because case in point it has very recently been revealed that Rocket and Groot were meant to get a spin-off movie together that was going to focus on Rocket's origin story and I feel like Guardians 3 would have just been the Adam Warlock stuff so they have to find a way of meshing both of those stories together and I just don't think that it works as well as it really could have so I do think that Adam could have been a great character he's played by a phenomenal actor but they just don't give him enough to do I did want to touch a little bit more on Rocket's backstory and his origin story I didn't really know how much I could really sort of say within a spoiler free review so I'm going to briefly talk about it now Rocket's origin story in this movie is the most heartbreaking thing I think I've seen since Tony Stark's death in Endgame those flashbacks can definitely be quite tough to watch because they can definitely be quite graphic and a bit disturbing at times especially when you do sort of have an idea of what it is that has happened to him because there's a scene where Rocket gets thrown into his cage and you can see like the little bit on his head where the High Evolutionary has, has probably done some surgery on his brain it's just it's really nasty actually getting to see this like you don't properly see anything too much on screen but it's more the aftermath of what's happened that you see and that's one of the reasons why it is as disturbing as it can be i did say that a lot of the imagery in these sequences definitely did stay with me and most of these scenes are when the uh, the characters are in their cages even though that sequence was released online about a week or so before the movie was released that scene where rocket um lila teeth and floor 
are all just lying down just looking up at the ceiling and just sort of talking about what their hopes and dreams are and coming up with their names as well it just it's a really beautiful scene it really does bring a smile to your face just seeing these characters being so hopeful and joyful and it makes it so much more heartbreaking when you see what happens to them later on and the other scene that stayed with me was when rocky actually sees all the little baby raccoons and he sort of like puts his face near them and like one of them just sort of like uh, runs up and just touches his nose and you just see them all just heading towards and the look on his face and everything that is definitely one of the scenes that definitely got me to well up a little bit as well as all the stuff with Lila Teeth and Floor because like they are really heartbreaking sequences they really are tough to watch and I think that the performance from Bradley Cooper in those sequences really does sell that because it is sad seeing Lila getting killed off absolutely but just the scream from Rocket in that moment it just it really goes through you yeah, and it really does sell just how shocking this moment is and I do also like it in that second sequence when he looks up at the wall and he sees what species it is that he is and then after that moment on when he introduces himself as Rocket Raccoon just thought that was a really really great scene I love that he actually embraces that name finally one thing that I really do like about the flashbacks is that they do fill in a lot of backstory when it comes to Rocket because there are definitely hints about what it is that he's been through within a volume 1 and volume 2 but I feel like actually knowing this stuff now and actually having all those little holes filled in it does make for an interesting idea actually re-watching volume one and two because you do sort of understand his perspective and perception of things a little bit better even his scenes with thor in infinity war and endgame it does make you understand where his mindset is during those sequences so i do really appreciate that and i would like to do a rewatch of those previous movies with the knowledge of what it is that rocket has been through i didn't really talk too much about rocket's friends in a spoiler free review but when it comes to lila teeths and floor i love what it is that they did with them in this film the performances and how they're written they're able to maintain this innocence and naivety that really helps make them as likable as they are and going in that direction you instantly do feel sorry for them the moment that you see them and what they They've been turned into when it comes to the voice talent i do think that who they've picked for each of these characters is a really great choice because we've got noah raskin playing baby rocket asim chowdhury playing teeps michaela hoover playing floor and the one that i was actually most surprised about was linda cardinelli voicing lila which makes her one of the actors who has made a very rare two appearances as two different characters within the mcu they really are perfectly played and that characterization of them really does add to that tragedy i've also got to do a really quick shout out to sean gunn who plays two roles in these movies where he's kind of the standing on set for Rocket and I think that what he does in that role is great and how he's able to interact with everyone is brilliant I really love him as Kraglin as well he does have a very underrated performance in these movies when it comes to the high evolutionary in this movie one of the things that I was kind of curious about when it comes to the trailers when I was seeing the trailers for the first time we saw him that I did think it sort of looks a bit weird why his his face seems the way the way it is because it looks like a mask of sorts. So both myself and a lot of other fans were theorising that maybe he does have like the sort of robotic look that he has from the comics. So I was expecting that to come off at some point, but I wasn't expecting to actually see what it is that we do see in that moment. That is definitely one of the moments that I think really does sort of push this. A bit further than a 12a race like the flashbacks with rocket are pretty nasty enough as they are especially with how it is that the high evolutionary does get that look that he goes for with rocket just scratching him up it is a really intense sequence and genuinely i'm amazed how they managed to get away with actually showing that in a 12a movie they do cut it in a way that you can sort of get around it but it is still a very intense sequence it did remind me a lot of two face from the dark knight and i remember seeing that for the first time on the cinema and i was quite young when that movie came out so it did freak me out quite a bit and i actually found it quite hard to look at the the screen whenever two face was on on there on screen so that's one of the reasons why i kept saying miss boy the free review that i would advise caution taking any younger viewers to go and see this one because it is definitely intense and some of the imagery definitely is quite disturbing and a little bit graphic even some of the creatures that the high evolutionary has created are pretty disturbing especially on the ones that you meet quite late on that's war pig who i've only really just found out is played by judy greer the creatures they're really creative they're very scary and well designed with a mix of animal body parts and cybernetics 
ethics and that really helps to emphasize just how horrible the high evolutionary is there is actually one of the animals that you do meet on the high evolutionary ship called Lamshank, and apparently he is actually played by james gunn himself i did want to briefly mention a little bit about what it is that's motivating the high evolutionary and what it is that i think influenced him becoming a villain because i feel like there is definitely a lot of god analogies in this movie like the guardians have gone up against some very very powerful villains in their time and one of the reasons why i feel like the high evolutionary was actually a really good villain for them to go up against in this movie was his aspirations to be a god he sees himself as a god that doesn't really care for anything beneath him and he has to perfect life and as the movie plays out you see that he started to get a bit more fearful of what rocket is able to do because his intelligence surpasses him it does definitely make for an interesting conversation and compared to some of the other villains within the guardians movies with the way that we had ego which was a character who basically was kind of like a representation of all the characters egos and that's kind of what he was meant to be as i said in a spoiler free review he isn't the most fleshed out and developed character but i do think that what it is that they are trying to do with him in this movie way he's kind of fits in with the, the main story because the focus of this story is on the guardians is on rocket and how the high evolutionary does fit into that story so it's more focused on them than him it makes sense to not have him be too fleshed out but they do give him enough motivation and enough history with the characters for there to be a proper conflict and i do feel like he was a good villain overall and as i said because he is just such an evil character just seeing him getting knocked around by the guardians left and right was just so satisfying i do kind of question why it is that rocket chooses to let him live because they have just absolutely slaughtered hundreds of these animal creatures to get to him and then they just let him live it's just i don't know how i feel about that i mean that does happen surprisingly a lot in these kind of movies anyway now one question that everyone had going into this movie based on everything that we were seeing from the marketing all the trailers all the posters all the tie-in stuff all the interviews we were very much led to believe that one or two main characters were going to get killed off in this movie so the question is does anybody die and the answer to that nope Everybody lives. that's not to say that nobody dies in this movie at all because we do have some pretty heartbreaking ones like lila teeps and floor but then we also have the high evolutionary basically commit like this gigantic genocide on an entire planet that he realizes has flaws that's one of the reasons why this movie is so dark because even the darker movies within the infinity saga like infinity war there was always that bit of doubt that oh they're going to bring everyone back this is pretty definitive and i do feel like that is really shocking for this movie and i feel like that is really hard to actually talk about especially if you are trying to recommend this movie to people because you are saying that this movie is a very sad movie but you don't really want to give away that nobody actually dies and it's actually quite a bittersweet ending none of the main characters die at all but the team does drift apart and all the characters go their own separate ways i did kind of guess based on everything i was hearing about this movie that that is the direction that they were going to go in but i did fully expect somebody maybe rocket maybe drax to have been killed off in this movie so i wasn't really surprised seeing the team drifting apart and the guardians kind of like finishing and a new team coming in but i was surprised that nobody had been killed off and it actually was quite a nice little happy ending and that is one of the reasons why i feel like the ending can be a little bit divisive for some people because they will be fully expecting something to happen but in my opinion i do think that it is a satisfying conclusion to this trilogy and we do get to see a few little things that were sort of teased in other movies that didn't necessarily need to be addressed in this but i'm glad that they did things like drax actually getting the chance to become a father once again looking after all the kids who've been imprisoned on the high evolutionary ship and he gets to have a little dance at the end of something that he always said that he absolutely hates because he thinks people who dance are stupid i like that they do sort of pay off that little running joke from volume one and volume two whenever group was dancing and every time drax looked at him he'd always freeze so it's just a nice little callback to those previous movies when it comes to groot actually getting the chance to actually say something properly he says i love you guys it is a really nice moment it did confuse me a little bit when i did see it but at the same time there was a fan theory that was going around that maybe this is when the audience finally understands what it is that he's saying and james gunn has very recently confirmed that that is actually the case so it's just a nice little touch to add on to the end of this it is definitely sad that this is probably the end of some of these characters because dave batista is moving away from marvel he's he's done with playing drax I know Zoe Saldana has said that she doesn't want to play Gamora anymore, so she's going to be moving on. I know Pom Clementif has expressed an interest in joining James Gunn's DC Universe. 
And I'm fully on board with that. I think that she could play some really great characters, so I really would like to see her appear in that. And while I brought that up, there's actually one thing that did cross my mind now that I've actually mentioned it, and that's Nathan Fillion does make a little cameo in this. So I honestly think that this is the one chance that they actually have to have Nathan Fillion as live action Hal Jordan Green Lantern in the TV series. I know they are going for like a true detective style story where it's going to be like a buddy cop thing with Hal Jordan and John Stewart. So I feel like having uh, Hal Jordan being the older, more experienced Green Lantern with Nathan Fillion as the lead actor in that would be a really good idea and I think that that could actually be really fun. Make it happen. I do want to quickly mention that I have seen a lot of people saying that they don't like that James Gunn keeps bringing his friends and family into every single one of his projects. And while I do understand to some extent, I do think it is a bit of a ridiculous thing to jump on. You know, because who wants talented actors doing a good job in any movies? It just makes no sense and I don't get why people keep latching onto it, especially when you have people like Christopher Nolan, Quentin Tarantino, Martin Scorsese who do the exact same thing. You even have filmmakers like Alfred Hitchcock who was known for making cameos in his movies but I do get where some people are coming from when they do say that they want to see newer fresher faces being included in these movies and that is definitely something that I can be fully on board with. So as much as I don't mind seeing those familiar faces making appearances in his movies again I would like to see a bit more of a mix of new and familiar faces. So back to this movie, it does make me think that a few of these characters we are probably never going to see again. I do think that this is the end for Mantis unless they are planning on doing some sort of spin-off with her in the future all on her own. It does feel like that is the direction that they are heading in but anything's really possible at this point. I do wonder what it is that they're going to do with regards to Gamora who's now gone off to join the Ravagers with the original versions of the Guardians of the Galaxy who I was convinced were going to take over as the Guardians but they are going to very firmly remain as ravagers. I would have liked to have seen more from those characters because all of them do make a reappearance in this with Sylvester Stallone, Michael Rosenbaum, Tara Strong makes an appearance in this who's taken over from Miley Cyrus. I would have liked to have seen more from those characters because I do think there is a lot of potential for them but I don't know if that's the direction that they're going to go with especially with Zoe Daldana actually leaving as Gamora and she is a character that is established to be part of that team now. So again we'll see how that turns out. I think it's very likely that we are going to get some sort of Star Lord oriented movie or Disney Plus TV series because the one thing that did surprise me is one of the post credit scenes sees Quill return to Earth to visit his grandfather, which is something that I have questioned many times over the years. Why has Quill never gone back to Earth to visit his grandfather? What happened to his grandfather? Does he know that Peter's still alive, that he has visited Earth in the past? So I'm glad that that is brought up in this, that they do address that, and that is where Peter ultimately goes. But I was really surprised to see that the final text of the movie is the legendary Star-Lord will return. So I do think that Star-Lord is going to make an appearance either in one of the future Avengers movies or potentially get his own little spin-off movie. I am definitely curious to see what direction it is that they do go with his character considering a lot of his story has been told now. But with regards to potential Guardians Volume 4, I don't know if that's necessarily going to be the case. I do like that they do establish that there is a brand new Guardians team with Rocket and Groot now being the leaders. I like that Adam Warlock is part of the team now. I like that Kraglin is now officially a Guardian. I like seeing Cosmo being a part of this. I love Cosmo. And there's another character in this that I'm not really that familiar with called Phyla. And apparently she is a character who does have a connection to Captain Marvel as well as somebody called Quasar who's a character I I'm familiar with, I've heard of them. So I'm curious to see if this team of Guardians does get to make an appearance sometime in the future or whether they are going to get a movie all of their own. I'll be honest, I was fully expecting Howard the Duck to be part of a new version of the Guardians, but he does make a little cameo in this, which is, it is nice to see him again, but I would like to see maybe some sort of like a special with him involved. Maybe that's the direction that they're going to go with a lot of these characters from now on with maybe having Mantis and Star Wars having their own little special presentation on Disney Plus or the Guardians having another Christmas or holiday special. As I said, anything is possible with these characters. But as far as we know, James Gunn will not be involved in any of these future projects, which is absolutely a shame because he is the reason why these characters have been as good as they are, why these movies have been as good as they are. So I don't know how people are going to respond to new interpretations of these characters with a new writer and director involved. We're quite well on Infinity War and Endgame, but I think people do tend to forget that James Gunn was actually a consultant with a lot of the Guardian sequences in that movie, so he is very much tied to these characters. I definitely would like to see more from them in the future. As I said, like Adam Warlock, there was definitely a lot of potential for, and I would like to see more of him in the future, as well as Nebula, who I think has been a very good character 
Doctor Who has really developed into something much better than she was originally. But with Marvel actually seemingly finally understanding that quantity is not better than quality and they are starting to kind of strip back on what it is that they are actually doing with regards to how much they're releasing at any one time. I mean admittedly the writer's strike has definitely had a bit of an impact on that. Maybe multiple spin-offs is not the direction that they are going to go with these characters so I am very curious to see what it is that they do with not only these characters but a lot of the other Marvel Cinematic Universe franchises as well. I am definitely hoping that the future of Marvel is much better than what phase four has been phase four was disappointing overall but it did have a few gems here and there and with things like spider-man no way home uh wakanda forever and now guardians there is still hope for them to really regain the momentum that they once had and the popularity that they had and the quality that they once had as well. So I am definitely hopeful for the future of the Marvel Cinematic Universe and DC as well. I've got to mention DC because James Gunn's connection to it and the fact that he is leaving Marvel to go and work with them now. So hopefully we are going to get a lot more great content in the future and I'm really looking forward to seeing what the future has in store. So I think I've gone on long enough for this video. So if you have watched this video, thank you very much for watching. If you do enjoy this content, please like, please subscribe subscribe hit the notification button to keep up to date on everything that's going on in here if you have any thoughts whatsoever on guardians volume 3 the future of the mcu how you would rank it compared to the other two movies let me know down in the comments just go wild have conversations debate about anything that you want it's spoiler filled go nuts also if you have any suggestions for any future rewind reviews you would like me to do in the future let me know down below if you have another chance to check out my spoiler free review for guardians volume 3 the link to that is going to be in the description below but until next time thank you very much for watching and i'll see you then on rewind reviews see you guys